The new ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to that here show, man. A story written by a current prisoner with your favorite journalist, Tony. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not trying to create any type of tension or animosity or create problems or create animosity. If anything, I'm trying to resolve my problems the right way, the way you should, man. Put the guns down, man, and put the gloves up. Ladies and gentlemen, I got a quick message from Mr. Boxer out there. You know, Paradigm, Broken News or whatever you want to call it, man. I just want to start off by saying, man, I respect this individual. I, I started off as being a big fan of his channel. I even went as far as re uh, reading his book from first page to last page. I read his entire book in its entirety. And it's a very good book, very well written. But I think me and you, man, like I said, man, we've had our problems. And I think it's about that time, Boxer, that we settle it once and for good when we step inside that ring. Like, gentlemen, you know, from my understanding, man, let me break down some simple math to you, Boxer. From my understanding, you were scheduled to fight three different times. You were scheduled to fight Rojo. You were scheduled to fight Little Toro. And you were even talking about uh, talking uh, fighting with Savage Studios. You remember that? I remember that clearly. Clear as day. All three opponents for whatever, it didn't happen. Left you in shambles. Left you looking for an opponent. You know, I found myself in the same predicament and in the same boat, bro. I was scheduled to fight on August 13th. My opponent pulled out for whatever reason. Left me in shambles, man. So you see how that simple math works out? You're looking for an opponent. I'm looking for an opponent. Me and you already don't like each other as is. Maybe we have a lot more in common than we know. Maybe we could be the bestest friends and we don't even know it, bro. So why don't we step inside that ring and handle it like gentlemen, brother? Much love to you. Much respect to your family, man. I'm not, I'm not trying to create any type of drama. I'm just trying to cause some excitement, brother, because I know the world would love to see me and you step inside that boxing ring and handle it like men. You know what I'm saying? Let, let's do it, man. Let's do it. If Thor didn't want it or if Savage didn't want it or if whatever didn't want it, I want it, bro. I would gladly step in there with you, boxer. Gladly. Any time of the week. Next week, a month from now, two months from now, and that's as far as I'm willing to give you. It's two months. I don't got all year. You and I both know that I have contacted you months ago before I was even going to fight Gunner. You and I both know that I sent a message through your boy Sandman. A month ago or two months ago. Because I was really trying to do this with you, Box. So what's up, brother? Let's do this, man. Two Latinos coming together, man. Uh, like like brothers. Uh, um, you know, don't, throw, throwing them hands like, like men. Shaking hands after. That's it, man. There's nothing better than that, brother. Let's go ahead and put on the show for the people. And uh, much love to all the people out there, man. That's all I got to say. You know, I showed up. I showed up on this yard, and they were all they were on lockdown. Uh, I showed up with my paperwork rolled up in a balloon in my, and uh, as so as my celly did, and I happened to land in a cell right next to um, James Cusack, who they call Bull, from uh, from the USAS. USAS skinheads, the United Society of Aryan Skins, who at the time were greenlighted by the the AB. Well, I didn't know that at the time, but that was what was going on. Uh, I gave this dude my paperwork. Uh, it was it checked out, and um, he sent me uh, over like a like a a big brown grocery bag full of uh, everything, like hygiene supplies and a radio, things to read, a pair of shoes to work out in, um, like everything I needed. He was, you know, I didn't get that kind of treatment when I showed up at the at these other prisons, the lower levels. They're just like, oh, these are your homeboys, like, and high and by. When I, when I got to this level four, I learned, you know, these guys were really close-knit, like, like a family, and, um, you know, everybody took care of each other there, and... Uh, on this yard, there was that dude Bull and and AJ, Pup. There was and Chris Jimenez. These these guys were all this USAS skinheads that had this green light on them. And um, the guy that had the the yard there at the time was named um, Storm and Norman from IE. He actually wasn't a U.S. citizen, but he had that yard and and knew they were green lighted and still had them keeping them there, trying to uh give them every, every chance they could to find a way to 
to not stab him, like like to help him find a way out of this, or or see if if the brand was going to change their mind on, on these decisions to to try to kill these guys because you know they were getting one orders from Pelican Bay, you know, to kill all of these dudes in USAS, and then Corcoran Shu is sending kites up there saying uh, we just want these five individuals got, you know, and so he 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 tried to give him every 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 opportunity to try to clean things up but uh, I mean unfortunately in the end it didn't it didn't work out that way they uh, AJ actually when Chris Jimenez uh, rolled it up he told him that uh, the guy AJ was also going to get killed so they came and actually extracted him off the yard he refused he didn't want to leave so he actually opened his tray shot and, and shot the block gun and sprayed pepper spray in there until they, they submitted and cuffed up so they could take him to the hole and get him off of the yard. And it, that was actually after Bull got stabbed. I kind of... Uh, when we when we came off lockdown and I finally got to come out and meet all the whites on that yard, it, I, uh, the atmosphere there was a lot different. It, it was a lot different. Like, I was just... I tried to stay quiet and just watch and I followed my older homeboy Donnie around and, you know, he introduced me to... Um, the other whites, and he had been there a little while, and I, I noticed it, it. It was just a lot different. But you know, as time went on there, let's see, you know, these, these, all these, most of these dudes there were doing life, and you know, I came and I had big, fresh rocker tattooed across my stomach, and and I noticed I caught myself talking about it. You know how I had earned this, and I could kind of see like as I would tell this story to people, like they're looking at me like. Like, what I did was nothing. Like, these dudes are killing people out here on the yard. Like, every every time they disciplined somebody, it was really, they were trying to murder them. That's, that's how it would go. Like, this dude Norm would say, oh, yeah, this guy owes money, and, uh, you know, he needs to get checked, get what he's got coming. And, you know, he'd give a couple of knives to these guys, and they got that order. But in their head, they're, they're thinking, like, oh, we're going to go put it down right now and, like, like, this is going to be better than the last one. That's the way they're thinking of it. So I'd catch myself telling these stories, and and I would think, I would start thinking, like, man, what I've done, it was really like nothing to these guys. So, you know, I started raising my hand there, saying to the dude that had the yard, to Norman, I'd tell him. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I'd tell him, like, I want to do a stabbing, like, or, or go with somebody that's got life and and go as a wingman. And um, he'd always tell me, yeah, 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 I got you. I'm going to send you on something. But, you know, I found out later that really he was just telling me that because I was young and I was going home soon. And he didn't feel right sending me on something like that because I could lose my parole date. I could even catch life, you know. They, it's happened to so many people in here. So, you know, he just kept kept making me think that I was going to do something and, I spent maybe a year and a half on that yard with him and, and had worked my way up to where I was actually a Mac rep there. I wasn't in charge of nothing because that dude Norm was fully in charge of that yard completely. Like, there's nothing happened there without his say-so. So he did make me a Mac rep in a building, which on a lower level would be like I had the keys to that block. But right there, it didn't mean that. It just mean that, you know, I made sure everybody's paperwork was checked. Um, I delivered orders to people for him sometimes or dropped off mail or moved weapon stock or weapons from one cell to the next for him and, um, and kept everybody informed on, on, on anything he wanted our, our people to know there. Well, the ISU unit and the gang unit, IGI, had came and rushed his cell in the middle of the night and snatched him up and took him said they were putting him in the hole, sending him to the shoe for a, a validation. So his celly, this dude, Kenwood, Kenny Hargett from Bakersfield had took the control of the yard after he left. Well, me and Kenny were pretty good friends at the time, so uh, I was in the loop on everything. I knew, you know, I had seen, I had seen the kite when, um, when Bull had got stabbed. They... This dude, Rob Hall from IE, had sent it to the yard, and it was addressed to Norm. And I will never forget how it was worded. 
when talking about Bull, they said that uh, he was to be ventilated or you and your yard would be green-lighted. Like, I'll never forget that, like, the way they said that. And, uh, you know, and they did. They they did have him stabbed. I was out there on the yard when it happened. It was... Uh, and I can't remember the four people that were involved, the, the shooters. But they had four four shooters and two victims, and it was Bull and a new recruit they had brought in named Pup from from Sacramento. He was a, um, he was in a... You have 60 seconds remaining. He was in a gang called Wolfpack, which had peckerwoods and skinheads that got absorbed by USAS. So, you know, these, these guys got both of them at the same time while they were playing handball. And, um, uh, it was, they got him pretty good. It was, it didn't kill either one of them, but that was what created that lockdown for Chris Jimenez to roll it up and them to come extract AJ off of the yard. You said that you were appointed an actual position. What what was this position called, and what were your responsibilities? Uh, they put me in a position called a MACREF, and it's, uh, it stands for a Men's Advisory Council. And... Um, Basically, what it is is the person, every race has a MAC rep in every building, and every race has an executive body MAC rep for the entire yard. And those generally consist of the person that is calling the shots for that race. So the guy calling the shots for us was that guy, Storm and Norman, and then later, Kenwood. Well... They they made me uh, I'm here up in my building and um, you know basically uh, it's my job to go and check check all the uh, all the white boys in that building check their paperwork um, and like I gotta write everything down on a on a scroll and it's gonna be like what they're here for their their entire name their handle what they go by uh, their age when they get out and how long their sentence is and, and all that gets documented from every building and then it's all collected and put on one big master sheet and then every time someone is going to get stabbed on a yard they put that they call it a roll call they put that entire roll call in a plug and send it with somebody up up their rear end to the to the hole so it can go to the shoe and um so after they made me a mac rep uh one day Norm comes to me and he's like he comes to my door, he's out walking the tear and he says he's like, Hey man, can um uh, I asked this guy to make a knife, can you fix it? Look at it and he gives it to me. And I've never been asked to do this, so I'm like, Yeah, I can do that and I look at it and it's all messed up. It's just a a long metal rod and it's sharpened like a pencil but it's real dull and it's got a big handle on it, it looks like a doorknob. So I'm like, Yeah, I I I, I take it from him and and I sharpened it up super, super sharp and put it, put a good handle on it. And I give it back to him the next day, and, and he's really impressed. He's like, oh, oh, well, this is great. Like, like that's your new job. He's like, you're going to be making our knives from now on. This this came out, like, perfect. So so I felt great. Like, I, I all of a sudden, like, I'm finally, I'm finally getting, like, some recognition there. Like, I feel like, all right. Yeah, I'm not feeling great about this because, like, they're happy with what I did. And, and at the time, I'm really young. I'm only I'm only 22 years old, and everyone else on this yard, these guys are all in their 30s and 40s, and everybody, yeah, they have all been doing time for a long time. Well, they moved me into another cell that's closer to them in their building, and, and they moved me in with a guy they call Ad Tech Fred. And this is, um, he's from way up in Northern California, but he had been doing time for a long time. He's like... Uh, Older, he's got long hair, whole face is tattooed, and so I was kind of nervous moving in with him because he looks like he he looks like a mean dude, like not friendly, hard to get along with. But he turned out to be really great. But the whole point was for him to start schooling me and teaching me how we do things in prison. So you know, and he does. He starts he starts teaching me like you know how we write kites, you know how many words you put on one line and, and, and how many 
lines you fit in, in between every bar and and the correct way to wrap them in plastic and 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 how you hide them how you hide them on you and 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 then he continues to teach me everything like 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 how we hide our weapons in the cell disguising them uh, up against the side of the lock this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded he teach me how to take uh, um metal knives and hide them into the corners of the lockers where they need the concrete and, and make soap, take a mixture of soap and coffee so it looks like a big a big rusty a big rusty weld mark on the side of the locker. And uh just a lot of stuff like that. He taught me how to open the fire sprinklers and how to unscrew our light in our cell to where we can hide weapons inside the lights and and um Anyway, after after living with this guy and, and, and starting to learn how we program and stuff, they asked me um, if I was willing to do anything. And I said, yeah, yeah, I wanted to. So, you know, they, they, they knew I had been raising my hand to do things. Well, the, at this time on this yard, like, normally it's called a no-hands policy. You, you can't get – they don't get anybody without a weapon. So – uh, they made an exception, so on the shark for for a short while, where they would do the two on one. So they asked me to do a two on one to get this dude Spanky from San Diego, you know, because he had got drunk in the day room and caused a big scene and disrespected the cops and they hit the alarm and you know, so the cops felt disrespected and he messed up the program for everybody. So you know, they, when they approached me, they were like, you know, this is what he did. We, we want to, like, like really beat this dude. Like, he's got to come and whoop him, you know? So, well, when we come out the yard, the plan is that uh, um, me and my homeboy, Kevin Kincaid, we're going to uh, we're gonna get this dude. But first, we're going to go talk to the southerner and let him know that we're putting down the yard. So, we do, and the southerners tell us uh, they also plan to do the same thing. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. So they tell us they have the same plan. So we tell them, all right, cool, we'll do it at the same time. Because um, it's a possibility that they'll recall the yard. So we go our separate ways, and another southerner in my building stops me. Well, my own boy Kevin keeps walking off to do what he's doing. And, and I'm talking to this dude, his name's Isidro. I had blown up his CD player. I was borrowing it. I, I blew it up trying to hook it up to my TV to a circuit board. And so I'm I'm explaining to him I'm going to buy him a new one and, and whatnot. Well, after talking to him for a few minutes, I hear the alarm go off. And I look, and there's a, these two Mexicans are getting on somebody in our workout area. So all the way across the yard. So I'm like, oh, man, I, I'm supposed to be this. I'm supposed to be on this dude's banky. So I look. And all it's they're all the way on the other side of the yard too, and, and Kevin's already already beating this dude at so I gotta run all the way across the yard. They're already yelling to get down. And and this is a active uh one eighty shoot kick out yard, so it's like it's real serious. They shoot real bullets there. And um I've gotta run about seventy five yards just to get to the fight. And they're already yelling at me to get down as I'm I'm the only one standing up besides the guys fighting and I'm running across the yard. And uh, I hear the tower start to shoot. They're shooting the block gun at me already. I can see the blue ball bouncing. And uh, I get there, and they're already on the ground. I slide in like 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 a a baseball runner would run into home plate. And I start getting on this dude. And his beanie's already pulled over his face. And I'm I'm just I just start hitting this dude as hard as I can, hitting him, bam, bang. And uh, finally, Kevin gets shot. My my homeboy Kevin gets shot in the leg with a uh, with the block gun. So. We back off and get down, and well, the cops had called it uh, um, over the radio as a code two, which means they need all staff to respond from the entire prison, which is usually what they would do for our, uh, that's the code they use for a riot. So the entire institution shows up from every yard. There's like a hundred cops on the yard, and they make this huge scrimmage line, and it's a big ordeal that for just two fights at the same time. It's, they thought it was a riot, so, you know, due to that, they they come and tossed our cell up and, and just thrashed our stuff and, and rolled it up, and it, it was bad, but that was my first 
that was the first thing that they asked me to do on that yard, and I don't know. At that time, I felt I felt pretty good about it. Um, uh, when this happens, you know, like you said, you say you felt you, you felt pretty good about it. Now, when you get back there, you know, do they start treating you a little bit more different? Like, as in, do you get a little more respect? Do you start walking out with your chest puffed out a little more? Yeah, yeah, I did. I do feel that way because, you know, every time I come out of my cell, they're like, you know, all the white boys, they're like, yeah, there he is. There's the homeboy big head right there. Like, like he's a little gangster. He put it down, you know. Like, cause we did a good job. He, uh, Spinky got, Spinky got whooped pretty bad. So, um, a two-on-one on that yard is so non-serious. You know that the that the administration knows that if we didn't use a knife, then everybody was good to stay on the yard. So they let Spanky stay on the yard, and and um, uh, part of his punishment was that uh, his he was being disciplined. He had to come out every time we had program, whether it was day room or yard. He had to come out and do 123 burpees, and uh, until the next mission came up for him. He had to go report to the hole for for what he did. He owed, they called it cleanup. So for about 30 days, he was doing burpees every yard, every day, until the next uh, the next dude that had to get stabbed came up, and it happened to be one of my homeboys named. Uh, you have 60 seconds remaining. Wayne Bowen, and he's an old man in a wheelchair. Well, when Spanky comes out to stab this guy. He stabs him in the chest four times and throws the knife. And my homeboy Wayne Bowen, he's, he doesn't need a wheelchair, but they, they're making him use one medical because he's getting old and he's, he's dying. Well, this this old man got up out the wheelchair and dropped Spanky three or four times. It was it was so embarrassing for him. He, he should have never thrown this knife, but it, it was real bad for him. Okay, so uh, my homeboy came to this yard. The old man named Wayne Bowen. Uh, he came from a medical yard uh, from Avenal. Well, that yard, like, is, uh, it has a, um, it has a, it's got a green light on it, so we're not allowed to stay there. So, if you have some life-threatening medical problem that needs to be, you need to go there and have addressed, then they expect you to do it from AdSeg. So you gotta, you gotta go get off on the yard. And, you know, for some people, that's just, it's not realistic for some old man to have to come out and, and, and find somebody to just take off on to go to the hole. So some people just stay there. And this guy, he did. He stayed there. And then when they finished his little, his liver treatment, whatever it was, they sent him to high desert. And when he showed up on the yard, uh, everything would have been fine except, you know, they, they, they seen that he's old and, and frail, so it's they wouldn't have touched him, but he starts throwing all these names around saying, oh, you know, you know, this guy from the brand, you know, he knows me and, and uh, he knows I was there and, and I've been doing time for this long and blah, 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 acting, talking all crazy. So so that good Norman uh, said, boy, you know, it, I, I wasn't going to have this done, but he, he's got to be dealt with. I just, I don't like this guy's attitude. So... Uh, that's how this guy got in that situation, and he didn't really need this wheelchair. But you, you would think um, you only ever hear stories about like, oh yeah, yeah, you got got by the guy in the wheelchair. But man, this dude really had it like that. He, um, one of his old cellies was on our yard. This old man Rock from IE, he, he was telling us he's like, he's saying, oh, Spinky's gonna have his hands full with this dude. He was a uh, uh, Wayne was a Golden Glove boxer when he was a kid. So he's like he is he's not gonna be able to he's not gonna be enough. This youngster isn't gonna be able to take him. And and sure enough, he wasn't. He he stabbed him three or four times and threw the knife and, and that dude Wayne got up and whooped him. He, now what you mean by whooped him, you mean he he got him he got him pretty good or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had he had these four uh, stab wounds in his chest but it it was nothing. He 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 said Spanky on his ass three or four times in that fight. Drop dropped him all the way to the ground. So now you said, now you mentioned along the lines 
that when he was being disciplined, that he had to come out the yard and he had to do 123 burpees. Now, why is it that is that, is that specific number? Uh, well, they issue out that number because uh, in here, let's see, the number 23 uh, represents the 23rd number of the alphabet, which is a W for white or wood. So they they incorporate that into everything, like everything. They got like uh, white people, uh, whites in prisons, they get that uh, number tattooed on them. They'll get a 16 and a 23 because it, it uh, stands for um, a W and a P for white power or, you know, so... When we do our, um, uh, when we do organized workouts, like like in the shoe or the hole, you know they they have a cadence, like you know they'll pause or they'll say something, like every time we hit 23 or so. The hundred burpees is is discipline. Plus he owes the other the other 23 is what they would say for the wood pile. So yeah, he owes that to our whole to our whole group on the yard and then. That, that's where the 23 comes in. Now, when you moved into that guy, when you had that guy move into you, and he and he was your cellmate, you know, he was obviously a little more seasoned than you were. Now, as as in different races, different um, they kind of study their cultures, their backgrounds, their history. You know, what what are some of the things that um, the whites, I guess you could say, as a race. What do you, what are some of the things that you guys study and indulge you guys yourself in? Oh, okay. A lot of the things that the whites in here, uh, they got a a library, a book kitty. Like somebody's somebody's usually responsible for holding on to this whole library in their cell. It'll have like it'll have a lot of uh, it'll have a lot of books on on the Vikings and and like Irish culture and and for the skinheads they all read uh they all read this book, Mein Kampf, and study it and uh they also read another book called David Duke's My Awakening and um, like that's mostly the skinheads. They like to like read that like it's their Bible. I would say I would say that guy um that that I moved in with Fred, he actually had a lot of books that he uh, he got me into reading. So I read um, like I read a whole a whole series, a couple of different series by the same author that um, that were popular that they passed around to most of the whites. And there was um, Bernard Cornwell's Saxon Tales and and um, the Warlord Chronicles. It's just all about it was all about Viking. Uh, Viking culture and how they how they left their homeland and come and raided and took over Europe. So those books were pretty popular, and that's that's mostly what people would study is like Nazi stuff and and, and Vikings and you know like uh, there's a lot of Irish stuff and books like that. At that point in time. When you were studying this and taking all this in, were you believing in it? Were you believing in it? And were you actually taking pride in some of these ideologies that that you were taking in? You know, at the time, yeah, I was a. Uh, at the time when I first got there, uh, that dude Bull, the USAS skinhead that they got, he he was my neighbor and he ran. He ran a group. It was uh, they call it the Odin Services. That's a religious, a religious group where they go and they study all this Viking stuff, mythology. Like, well, I I signed up and I started going to that and um, you know, because I seen all these all these dudes I'm looking up to. They all go to it and they learn, and they learn uh, they learn how to read runes and and uh, basically just just learn about our our people's culture. So. You know, I bought into it for a while. I thought I thought it was pretty cool just to just to learn that stuff. But as far as like like how the skinheads are in here, their beliefs and 
you know, I guess I guess you're given, you know, you're young and you're impressionable. I was given a, a set of beliefs, like like I took on other people's beliefs in here. It seems like 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 I didn't even come here and think that I was better than other people just because I'm white. And that's the kind of stuff that they that's the kind of stuff that they preach in here and and, and try to try to put it put into you that like that you're better than everybody else and and that like we're a supreme a supreme race. Like, they, they teach that in here, you know? Now, you said that you weren't a gang member before you came to prison. No. Now, be, were, were you racist before you came to prison? You know, I, um, I don't know. I wouldn't, I, I don't call myself racist because I don't, um, I don't hate or just like anybody based on their who you know what 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 race they are but uh living in here i would i think i think it turns you a little you you get more racist because you know it's the 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 lifestyle in here they separate you by race and and they take it so serious this uh, uh you know the inmates like like, like I can't even, I can't even cut through a certain part of the yard. I can't walk through a blacks area, or a northern Hispanics area, or Indians. Like, I have to actually cut around and go, go all the way around on the yard to get through their areas. Like, so I think, I, I think you just, it, you get so used to that lifestyle and, and and the way people act in here. Like, they won't. Like, I can't drink off. I can't drink off this guy's cup because he's black or, you know, vice versa. I think you get you get so used to that, you become a product of your environment and it and it sticks with you. Like I, I don't I don't I don't feel like a racist person. Like I don't like I, I wouldn't have no problem marrying a girl that was Mexican or black. It wouldn't it wouldn't bother me, like it wouldn't stop me from pursuing a relationship. But I think just being in here around all this it, you really you really pick up a lot of bad, uh, bad habits. Real quick question that's off topic, but has there ever been a situation or it, it, if this situation were to arise, let's just say, you know, basically, like you said, your, the belief system is is is, is be, belonging to the supreme race. Has there ever been a situation where you guys go to the visiting room and perhaps one 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 of the Nazis or one of your your fellow comrades, their wives are black, or their family's black, or anything like that. What would happen in that situation? You know, it's funny you ask that because I have seen that personally, and um, I think uh, usually when you know one of the white boys' is, uh, wives or ladies is a Mexican or Indian, nobody trips on it, but uh, I did see it at High Desert. Uh, I don't remember exactly who the guy was, but um, he had a black old lady and a kid, and they came to visit him, and they stabbed him off the yard. They got rid of him immediately. What? Can, can you please... Do, uh... Do you know the 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 scenario of events that led up to that? And, and you know, was there questioning? Was there was there politicking? Was there some people that were against it? Some people were for it? Did people try to save his uh, salvage his career? Yeah, well, yeah, there's it's a big there's a lot of politicking involved in it because uh, you know if it all depends who's on the yard. Now, if if the general if in general the whites had you know, just ignored it, it would have been fine, but... You have 60 seconds remaining. There was enough people in that yard, enough skinheads, and people that it thought it reflected negatively on the rest. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. So, yeah, there was enough of these people on the yard that it, it just became a, it became enough to remove him because, you know, you was maybe 60, 70% of the yard was advocating for this guy to get stabbed behind his back like he wasn't he didn't have no he wasn't involved in this discussion at all this all took place behind his back his fate was completely decided without him even knowing there's a 
Um, there's another uh, uh, one of my homeboys. He's actually on this side because of something like that. He um, uh, he has kids with a um, he has kids with a black girl, two kids, and and um, it became an issue on the yard. And he he had, you know, fortunately for him, it, it was brought up like that to where he had a choice. He had a choice, you know, where he could decide to just get out of there, and he didn't have to suffer the consequences of somebody shoving a knife in his stomach, you know? My, all right, my question is, these individuals that are being removed, or for instance, like that guy, what what kind of individual was this? Was this an individual that was fully pledged, fully committed to, to, to your guys' cause? You know, uh, I don't know the guy. I, I don't remember the guy from High Desert that he got stabbed. But um, if he was on that yard, on that shoe kick out yard, then, and he was programming, then he is definitely, he was definitely a part of our group for sure. Like, like you, you know, you could count on that guy to have your back. But, but you know, you know, he fell in love with someone out of his race and brought her to the, brought, he involved her, you know, and he brought her into the prison and, and that just, maybe he didn't know it was going to backfire on him like that, but it it would definitely, it would definitely start, start something bad for you because it just generally, it, it's looked at negatively in here, like. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Yeah, it just. I don't know. It's uh, yeah. He may have been. He may have been for you know for our cost all the way, but it just in general the the, skin, the skinheads have a little bit of influence on our yard, especially if they got a lot of numbers. You know, you say that they you say that they have fifty or sixty percent of our population, then they got they got a pretty big voice as far as being able to. You know, to, to campaign against you and, and and get it get enough support to get the guy that has the art to get you removed. Back at that time, back in that time when the situation took place, were you were you politicking against this individual? Were you for it to remove him off the yard, or not? No, I wasn't. Uh, 